A building fire in Clinton is nothing new. In the past, many buildings have caught fire and burned down. Main Street caught fire and burned to ashes in 1891. This building itself caught fire twice a hundred years ago. But this time, the most recent fire took not just an ordinary building. This was a national registered historic site that contained countless memories of the town. This is the Clinton Music Hall, and it was the center of Clinton's entertainment for locals over a hundred years ago. There was an announcement in the local newspaper, the Clinton Democrat, March 21st, 1891, describing the local entertainment for the coming weekend. It was a well-known Indian medicine show, and it was going to be great. All the entertainers were on roller skates, performing comedy, selling popular cough cure medicines, and so on. The show was going to take place right here in the Clinton Music Hall, which was constructed in the 1880s by two local businessmen, Charles Altermus and his brother. The original building was not built as a music hall. It was a livery stable renting stables for horses and mules. When the Altamus brothers completed the renovation to turn the building into a music hall, it didn't look like one. There was nothing to distinguish the building as an entertainment venue. No bright lights shined on the walls, no theatrical decorations. But somehow it worked. For whatever reason the Altamus brothers got into show business, they managed to book all kinds of shows and entertainments, filling the music hall most weekends. Charles Altermus and his brother were able to make the music hall business work in Clinton. This was possible because entertainment was developing all over the country. In particular, the show business was developing in New York City and Philadelphia. The proximity of these two cities influenced the area. A bicycle. A bicycle. A bicycle. In the mid-1800s, Large American cities were experiencing a boom in entertainment. America was, 
for the first time producing its own form of stage shows after years of performing Shakespeare, opera, and other forms of European entertainment. During the first half of the 1800s, the entertainment business as we have come to know it began to develop. After the Civil War, the things needed to further that development seemed to come together. The Industrial Revolution brought large numbers of people to the cities. The increasing number of white-collar workers created a demand for nightlife. Theater builders across the country seized the trend and built better and larger theaters at a fast pace. New York City, as an example, had more theaters in the Midtown area than any city in the country. In this young and ever-expanding country, motivated show people became more eager and more creative. Writers and performers were hungry to create new and distinct forms of American entertainment. The result was vaudeville, minstrel shows, burlesque, extravaganzas, musical reviews, musical comedies, Indian medicine shows, and more. Business-savvy show people began to take full advantage of the developing railroad network and the increasing communication by telegraph to improve show schedule efficiency. At the same time, the emerging star system began to generate strong and loyal audiences. At this time, there was no shortage of great shows and stars. The seemingly endless availability of new shows and their intoxicating stars brought excitement to the night, helping to make New York City the city that never sleeps. But people who lived in remote areas like Clinton were far from the city nightlife. Imagine a place with no internet, no recorded music or live TV, no electricity and no highways. That was how the people lived in Clinton 100 years ago. The town was small and sleepy. It was surrounded by farmland. Apart from daily work, there was very little leisure time. When nightfall came, the town went dark with it. Thanks to Charles Altermus and his brother, who built the Clinton Music Hall, that began to change. We don't know how they came up with this idea, but it brought nightlife into the town. Here where I'm standing was the platform for the trains that began coming into Clinton well over 150 years ago. And right next to it, was the Clinton Music Hall. People who lived in the area came here for the trains. About 50 miles east, the train could get them to New York City. About the same distance west, the trains could take them to Philadelphia in an hour or so. Once those hungry traveling show groups learned about the geographic convenience of Clinton, they didn't mind stopping here to make a few dollars at our wonderful Clinton Music Hall. This is the Clinton House, a three-story building that's been open for business since 1743. The ground floor was a restaurant and tavern serving food and alcohol just like it does today. The second and third floor were hotel rooms. Conveniently, the music hall was located just steps across from it. So when performers decided to bring their shows to the music hall, staying at the Clinton House was the obvious choice.
At one time, many believed that Clinton would become an important city like so many others across the country. To take advantage of this opportunity, more people came to settle in Clinton, including Germans, Italians, and the Irish. They opened up shops on Main Street and built houses nearby. By the time Clinton was a self-ruled and independent town in 1865, it had grown into a fully functional community. Main Street was lined with shops, a blacksmith shop, a monument carver, a horse stable, a supply store, post office, two hotels, meat markets, wheelwrights, clothing stores, shoe leather stores, a drug store, and a department store. There were also law firms, a bank, and the newspaper, The Clinton Democrat. There were four churches and more than 800 people lived in the town itself. This is Main Street. Most of the buildings on both sides were rebuilt a year after the Great Fire wiped out nearly 80% of the buildings in 1891. Back in those days, Main Street was the place where people did business. The locals relied on coming to this street to get their daily needs, food, clothing, and medicine. Main Street was the center of all activities. When important shows came to town, the organizers and promoters would usually use Main Street to create an event. The big shows even brought their own brass bands to town. Normally, on the afternoon of the evening show, the band would go down Main Street just like a marching band, and the locals would get very excited to see the show. I'm standing across from what used to be Baker's Drugstore. Later on, it was renamed Bonnell's Drugstore. The important thing to remember is that this is where the music hall tickets were sold. There's the hill. There's the hill. Where's the hill? valuable collection of items related to the music hall history. There are photographs, there are actual tickets, and photos like these. Back in those days, there were so many shows that came to Clinton. There were comedies and minstrel shows. One can only imagine the excitement that these shows brought to small town America. Vaudeville was a popular form of stage entertainment that began in about the mid-1800s. It paralleled the other form of entertainment called the minstrel show. But vaudeville, because of its variety, tended to appeal to a much broader audience when compared to minstrel shows, which were for men only. The term variety has something to do with a theatrical variety show. It described a form of French pastoral show that was very popular in the 19th century. It was adopted by the British and became widely used as a form of variety show at the same time. When American performers adopted it, they used the same themes based upon the already tried and true formulas of the French and British. Vaudeville acts were carefully structured into eight to ten acts called turns. The shows offered a little bit of everything. Magic acts, singing, dancing, juggling, jokes, animal acts, and kept going on with celebrity cameos, even phony boxing, and the hot topics of the day. As vaudeville got popular and became profitable, show business entrepreneurs took control of all aspects of the shows. They exercised that control not only over the stars, but to the building and the buying of the theaters. The most famous vaudevillian entrepreneurs of the day were Benjamin Franklin Keith and Edward Albee. Keith began his career in show business as a grifter and barker with traveling circuses. In a few years, he became the most powerful man in vaudeville. He earned the title of the father of American vaudeville. Albee, another theater tycoon, partnered with Keith to run the vaudeville business. 
They own some 700 theaters with a total of 15,000 vaudeville performers. Keith and Albie had a very organized style of show management. They divided their shows according to size and importance. Some were called big time and the others called small time. Big time shows would be shown in the big cities and the larger theaters such as the Palace in New York or the Bijou Theater in Boston. Big time performers got paid more while small time performers booked in smaller cities or towns were paid less. Here in Clinton, with its small population and only a few hundred seats in the music hall, it neither qualified as big time or small time. So why did Charles Altimus think building a music hall was a good idea? And how did he get shows to come to Clinton? I have in front of me the most widely used theater reference guide of the day, Julius Kine's Official Theatrical Guide. It listed theaters throughout the United States with very detailed information about the location, the size of the stage and lighting conditions, the number of seats, expected ticket price, hotels and inns with their prices, and even transportation to each of the towns. The information in this book was updated and republished every year. The Clinton Music Hall was in this guide. It may have been that Charles Altimus had a copy of this book. It would have enabled him to contact traveling shows all over the country, and they could have contacted him as well. It would have become a wonderful two-way street. Sometimes the Clinton Music Hall just got lucky. The small-time shows did come to Clinton, especially at the end of the decade. When they came, it was big time for Clinton. On August 27, 1886, the Guinness Company of Union Square, New York, came to Clinton with their three-act musical comedy called Fun in the Grocery Store. The main character was called The Bad Boy. Neither the company or the show were well known, but much excitement was stirred up in Clinton by the local newspaper, The Clinton Democrat. Guinness Company from Union Square, New York, will appear in the great three-act musical comedy, Fun in the Grocery. When the Guinness Company's arrival was announced on the front page, small time was now indeed big time. The locals wanted to see the show from New York. The locals wanted to see the bad boy. The Guinness production was a one-for-all kind of vaudeville show. Everyone liked it. As a light comedy show with lots of music, dance, and laughter, it was the perfect show for the whole family. Just like folks in other towns, Clinton too wanted a chance to see first-rate shows, especially during the holidays. Holiday shows added to the festivities and the excitement of the season. To make that happen, the music hall needed groups like Gorton's New Orleans Minstrels. Gorton's New Orleans Minstrels was a well-known company not only did they have great performers, but they had a great band. It was called the Gold Band, and it was the best band that ever performed in Clinton. Two weeks before Thanksgiving, Gorton's New Orleans Minstrels arrived in Clinton. The weather was terrible. Nevertheless, the Gold Band made a glorious entrance parade right here down Main Street. When night fell, the show went on, and they gave a great performance. The enjoyment and appreciation of the locals was beyond description. It wasn't just a big night. It was a tremendous night for the Clinton Music Hall and for the town of Clinton. Since the construction of the Clinton Music Hall in the 1880s, countless shows were performed there. In time, it helped to transform the town from a simple rural village into a culturally active small town with its own character. May seem simple, but this transformation took decades. To the locals, coming to the music hall had become quite ordinary, but over time it became much more than just the music hall. It became the center of activity. This process of coming together helped create the sense of community. People would come together not just to see a show, but to see their neighbors and friends. They socialized, 
shared news, and made new friends. It was used for public meetings, political rallies, by religious groups to share their beliefs and often by business companies to show and sell their products. It was an ideal place for educators to give lectures. The schools even used it for their commencement exercises. The town of Clinton would not have looked like Clinton without the presence of the Clinton Music Hall. It didn't stop there, however. In the early 20th century, Clinton was about to embrace its golden age. In the late 19th century, the industrial expansion had made America an economic powerhouse. New inventions were a constant in an ever faster paced society. Many important inventions took place in this time period. The telephone was invented by Alexander Graham Bell. Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla brought electricity and electric light to shine in the darkness. Then moving pictures were born. As a result of these inventions, America would never be the same again. Neither would Clinton. By the time Clinton installed electricity, the town was marching into the new century, and ownership of the music hall had changed hands several times. The Altimus brothers, the original owners of the music hall, fell into financial difficulties in the late 1890s. The building was badly damaged by fire twice and then it was struck by lightning, causing further damage. The Altimus brothers were forced into voluntary bankruptcy. Music Hall was bought by the First National Bank at a sheriff's sale in 1905 for $2,450. During the years of ownership by the First National Bank, a well-known New York-based company owned by H.S. Tyler continued to run the music hall under a contract that preceded ownership by the First National Bank. Tyler and his company had strong connections to other theaters and performing groups that stretched across New York, Philadelphia, and Delaware. This allowed the music hall to have bigger and better shows. The popular show New York Day by Day was an example of the bigger and better shows that Tyler was able to bring to Clinton. This popular show regularly performed in many of the best theaters, the Bowdoin Square Theater in Boston, the National Theater in Philadelphia, and now it came to perform in Clinton. Without Tyler's connections, this wouldn't have been possible. During the years of the Tyler Company's management, Clinton residents got to experience some of the truly big-time shows. Then came the age of moving pictures. After inventing moving pictures in 1888, Thomas Edison wasted no time in creating the first movie studio called the Black Mariah in West Orange, New Jersey. Under the name The Kinetoscope, Edison's company made all kinds of films news events, and human interest stories. Later on, they made big productions of comedies, dramas, and such popular titles as Buffalo Bill and Ben-Hur. By the early 1900s, motion pictures had become a big industry. The wonder flourished in every corner of the country, and it shined on Clinton as well. When moving pictures became big business by 1910, the Clinton Music Hall was sold to Morris W. Robinson. Robinson took advantage of the moving picture fever by showing movies every week. Films like King Lear, The Maid and the Millionaire, or even a Swedish winter film documentary were shown. This was the silent film era, and all of the moving pictures were shown without sound. To make the movies more interesting and to keep the audiences engaged, the theaters used live performance, such as a piano or an organ, or in the bigger theaters, even an orchestra might play. Clinton couldn't afford an orchestra, but that didn't mean that Clinton didn't have music. 
For music, the Clinton Music Hall relied largely on local talent. During the early 1900s, there was a couple known as the Howells who traveled from town to town. They could provide projection equipment if needed or operate the on-site projector if available. Additionally, the Howells could bring some of the most popular movies of the day, such as The Musician's Love Story, Honeymoon at Niagara, the passion play Life of Christ, How to Get Rid of a Troublesome Count, or a thrilling portrayal of a Japanese tragedy. When the locals learned that J.T. Howell and his wife were coming to town, the music hall was usually packed, not only to see a great movie, but to enjoy Mrs. Howell's singing and dancing. However, things could go wrong. One day in June 1908, the Howells were supposed to come to Clinton to show some films. Unfortunately, their automobile broke down and the show was canceled. The locals were greatly disappointed. On another occasion, there was a large audience waiting for the Howells. On that occasion, there was a power failure in Clinton. Mr. Howell was not on the scene at the music hall, and there was another cancellation. Naturally, this angered many of the locals. However, these occurrences were so rare that they were overcome by the excitement of this new age of wonder. This building on Main Street is now a coffee house. It serves not only as a community center, but as a home away from home for many of the regulars. It has always been an important retail location for Clinton. Around 1916, this building was still owned by the Hoffman family. The Hoffmans owned the largest business in town. And as the movie craze swept across the country, it was rumored that the Hoffmans wanted to open a movie theater in this very building. That became a problem. Coincidentally, the new owner of the music hall was planning on opening an automobile business in that building. Patrons feared that he might discontinue the music hall and replace it with his new venture. There was a lot of confusion among the locals. It became apparent to local patrons that they had to find ways to express their strong attachment to the music hall. They made it clear that even if the Hoffmans opened a new theater in this room, which in fact was potentially ideal in terms of size, location, and other factors, they would still remain loyal to the original Clinton Music Hall. Moving pictures were all the rage everywhere. Clinton didn't want to be left out. Even when the new owner, Charles W. Bunnell, bought the Music Hall property in July 1916, he took the Music Hall to new heights. Within months, he remodeled the building and made big improvements. Above the main entrance, he installed an electric marquee. This was a first for the Clinton Music Hall. The local newspaper, the Clinton Democrat, jokingly described the new look as the Tenderloin, referring to a popular theater district in New York City. In addition to the electric marquee, Bonnell had just completed the opening of his Ford Overland car showroom, just to the left side of the music hall. The shiny new models of the latest Ford Overland created a real excitement, and these additions gave the building a modern look, reflective of the new 20th century. All this was witnessed by a local boy, William Hulsizer, who grew up with the Clinton Music Hall. William Hulsizer was born in 1892. When he was six years old, his parents moved to Clinton. They bought this house at 15 East Main Street, directly across the street from the old Grandin Library, which is still standing. When Hulsizer was eight years old, he got a job selling tickets for the Clinton Music Hall. The locals loved to spend their time and their dimes watching shows and moving pictures. It was standing room only every Wednesday and Saturday. At times, you could hardly get a ticket. Sometimes, little Billy snuck into the music hall to watch the movies or Maggie Lenton's slideshow or even a live show performance. Whether it was Uncle Tom's Cabin, the most popular play of the day, or Buffalo Bill's exciting Wild West show with his spectacular 
Colt 45s blazing, or the newly released Queen Elizabeth, little Billy Hulsizer enjoyed them all, and he did so free of charge. Since the time when Clinton built its own music hall, there have been countless groups and artists that have come to perform on her stage. The energy of that showmanship stimulated the town and inspired local talent to organize their own performing group. In time, Clinton introduced many of its own entertainment artists, stage actors and musicians. They ranged from the amateur to the highly regarded, such as Anna Case. Anna Case, a well-known opera singer, was born and raised on Main Street, Clinton. It's possible. Anna Case may have been much influenced by the shows performed in the Clinton Music Hall throughout her childhood in Clinton. It could have had a strong influence in her decision to become a professional opera singer. At the age of 20, she became one of the most important American opera singers. She was, in fact, the first American opera singer with the Metropolitan Opera Company who had no European training. The beautiful and talented Anna Case was so important that the Metropolitan Opera House still has a plaque today honoring her for her contribution to American opera. Clinton Music Hall, in spite of its unlikely location and building structure, enjoyed great success for over half a century. It played an important role in shaping the culture and character of Clinton. It was an indispensable gathering place that benefited the locals. Sadly, it met its decline by the 1950s, as did most of the vaudeville theaters throughout the country. But you know, that's interesting. There was somebody in White House that was said to have done some To honor these losses, especially after the fire of 2016, local organizations have been actively preserving this part of the Clinton Music Hall history. But what we really like is more memorabilia, ticket stubs, a theater seat, and the Holy Grail, of course, is the curtain, famous curtain from the auditorium. Uh, people talk about it, people mention uh, that it was taken down when the building was converted to commercial space, but if we could only find that, it would be fantastic. It's fascinating to think about Clinton as a place where arts and culture have, have flourished. Today we think about the Red Mill and the Hunter Art Museum, but of course it all began with the music hall in the 19th century. We are the beneficiaries of that legacy. Culture is the lifeblood of any community, and we are so lucky in two museums, it shows history and contemporary art, it's linking past and present. It's really an amazing benefit to this community to have both of these institutions and of course they're based on the environment that the music hall created by inviting culture to Clinton. The buildings such as the Red Mill and the 
and the objects that we have are the way that we tell the story of our culture and our society. And losing the music hall as one of those vehicles was really a great loss. So we understand there are objects out there such as the curtain from the stage and tickets that we would love for people as they see this. Hopefully they could find them and share those with us and they could become part of our collection to better tell that story. We're in the middle of a rehearsal for one of the most popular tunes of the 1890s. It was called A Bicycle Built for Two, and it was probably performed many times at the Clinton Music Hall. So these kids are very prepared for doing a show like this because they've just done the Newsies, which was based in the 1890s. So they learned to work really hard and rehearse about the time, and the time period, and that's what they're doing in the show right now, which they probably did back in the old Clinton Music Hall. How long did the kids have to prepare for this? Prepare to do a show like this, because we just did Newsies, which was also based in the 1890s. This we rehearsed in about two weeks, and that we spent months rehearsing. So they worked really hard to learn the time period. It won't be a stylish carriage. I can't afford a carriage. But you'll look sweet upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. If we think about all the excitement that took place at the music hall, we're struck by the fact that there is hardly a person left who can remember it. On a grand scale, the music hall shows those insignificant melodramas, the comedies, even the unblushing chorus lines that played for six decades are hardly considered as having made any profound contribution to the development of America's dramatic arts. Rather, the Clinton Music Hall is the reflection of the constant progression of a new nation, a land of ambition, innovation, and enthusiasm the land of the American dream.